Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omahundro Institute. John Adams to William Tudor Sr., 29 March 1817. Dear Sir, The scene is the council chamber of the old townhouse in Boston. The date is the month of February, 1761, nine years before you came to me in Coal Lane, as this was five years before you entered college. That council chamber was as respectable an apartment, and more so too in proposition, than the House of Lords or House of Commons in Great Britain or that in Philadelphia in which the Declaration of Independence was signed in 1776. In this chamber, near the fire, were seated five judges with Lieutenant Governor Thomas Hutchinson at their head as Chief Justice, all in their new fresh robes of Searle's English cloth, in their broad bands and immense judicial wigs. In this chamber was seated at a long table all the barristers of Boston and its neighboring county of Middlesex, in their gowns, bands, and tie wigs. You now have the stage and the scenery. Next follows a narration of the subject. I rather think that we lawyers ought to call it a brief of the cause. And welcome to episode 261 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. The Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights is the term that we use to refer to the first 10 amendments to the United States Constitution. Now, many of us have heard about the rights contained within these Bill of Rights amendments. For example, we often hear about the First Amendment which states that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or bridging the freedom of speech or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. We also hear a lot about the Second Amendment, which states, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. But what about the other eight amendments within the Bill of Rights? What about the Fourth Amendment? The Fourth Amendment to the United States Constitution doesn't always make headlines, but it is an amendment that undergirds really important foundational rights. It's also an amendment that can show us a lot about the intertwined nature between history and American law. History and the law often go hand in hand, and that's because many of the rights we have today came from our early American past, which is why we're going to explore the history and origins of the Fourth Amendment so that we can better see where our rights came from and how they've developed over time. Now, the Fourth Amendment is the amendment that promises us the right to be secure in our persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures by the government. It stipulates that if the government wants to search and seize our persons, houses, papers, and effects, it has to obtain a warrant based on probable cause and on an oath or affirmation stating that cause. Further, the Fourth Amendment also specifies that the warrant granted to the government has to specify the places the government can search and the persons or things it can seize. But what do all of these stipulations and provisions in the Fourth Amendment mean? And how and why did this protection against unreasonable searches and seizures come to be included in our Bill of Rights? Thomas Clancy is a professor emeritus at the University of Mississippi School of Law. He's also an expert on the Fourth Amendment. So as we investigate the history and origins of the Fourth Amendment with Tom, Tom reveals what the Fourth Amendment is and what it means, how experiences with English law and the American Revolution inspired the Fourth Amendment, and how early Americans understood the Fourth Amendment and how their understandings of the Fourth Amendment impact our modern day use and interpretations of the amendment. And now our fourth Doing History series continues with an exploration of the history and origins of the Fourth Amendment. When the British ministry received from General Amherst his dispatches announcing the conquest of Montreal and his subsequent annihilation of the French government and power in America in 1759, 
They immediately conceived this design and took the resolution of conquering the English colonies and subjecting them to the unlimited authority of Parliament. With this view and intention, they sent orders and instructions to the collector of the customs in Boston, Mr. Charles Paxton, to apply to the civil authority for writs of assistance to enable the custom house officers, tide waiters, land waiters, and all to command all sheriffs and constables to attend and aid them in breaking open houses, stores, shops, cellars, ships' bales, trunks, chests, casks, packages of all sorts to search for goods, wares, and merchandises which had been imposted against the prohibitions, or without paying the taxes imposed by certain acts of Parliament called the Acts of Trade. Mr. Paxton, no doubt consulting with Governor Bernard, Lieutenant Governor Hutchinson, and all the principal Crown officers, thought it not prudent to commence his operations in Boston. For obvious reasons, he instructed his deputy collector in Salem, Mr. Cockle, to apply by petition to the Superior Court in November 1760, then selling in that town, for writs of assistance. Stephen Sewell was then Chief Justice of that court, an able man, an uncorrupted American, and a sound Whig. He expressed great doubts of the legality of such a writ and of the authority of the court to grant it. Not one of his brother judges uttered a word in favor of it, but it was an application on the part of the Crown. It must be heard and determined. After consultation, the court ordered the question to be argued at the next February term in Boston, i.e. in 1761. Joining us is a professor emeritus at the University of Mississippi School of Law. He's an expert on the Fourth Amendment and on cybercrime, and he lectures nationally on both of these topics. He's the author of numerous articles and books, including his most recent book, The Fourth Amendment, Its History and Interpretation. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Thomas Clancy. Thank you, Liz. I'm happy to be here. I look forward to the interview. So, Tom, we're here to talk about the Fourth Amendment in the Bill of Rights, which, when you read it, assures, quote, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized, end quote. So, Tom, that's the Fourth Amendment, and I wonder if you would tell us more about that amendment and what it means. What are the specific rights that the Fourth Amendment is designed to protect? It's a great place to start, and that's the language and structure of the amendment. And so I'm going to repeat some of what you just said. If you look at the language of the amendment itself, it's both a promise and a right. It's a promise and a right to be secure against the government. The rest of the first clause of the amendment is limitations on that right. So we have a right to be secure, but it's only in four objects, our person, house, papers, and effects. If it's not on the list, it's not protected. So we know what a person is. It's your body and your person and your thoughts. A house can be expanded to the curtilage and your garage, etc. Papers, the modern equivalent of a paper is data. And then effects. An effect is an old term, but it's personal property. What is not included on that list is anything outside of a building called a house. So all of our lakes, our fields, our forests are not protected by the amendment. There are places where the government can wander at will, even if it's owned by somebody. The other aspects of the amendment limitations are we're only protected against searches and seizures by the government. And those are technical terms sometimes divorced from the ordinary meaning of those terms. So if it doesn't fit within the definition of a search or a seizure, that governmental activity, it's not protected. So, for example, if the police officer is standing on your sidewalk, 
and looking into your house, that's not a search within the meaning of the Fourth Amendment. If you're, for example, in a coffee shop working on your computer and an officer walks up behind you and looks at your screen, he's in a place he's entitled to be and the court is not going to label that a search. So you have to know what a search is and what a seizure is and it has to invade one of those four interests. We're still not done with the structure here because it's not all searches and seizures that we're protected against, but only unreasonable ones. And so that term, unreasonable, regulates a vast amount of governmental activity. So this is a document that was created you know, over 200 years ago that regulates a vast amount of modern activity. The second clause of the amendment does only one thing, and that tells us under what circumstances a warrant may issue. And it's listed right in the clause itself. You have to have an oath or affirmation particular description of the place to be searched, the things to be seized, person to be arrested, and that warrant has to be based on probable cause. So there's the structure of the amendment, and that structure is what the court uses to create regulation of this vast amount of governmental activity that it now regulates in today's world. Wow. There's really a lot going on in that amendment, isn't there? We have to understand searches and seizures and how the courts might define unreasonable. And as you mentioned, Tom, the Fourth Amendment and the Bill of Rights were authored over 200 years ago. So I think to really understand the Fourth Amendment and its language and origins, we really need to dive into its history and context. So my understanding is that the first federal Congress offered the Fourth Amendment because of past abuses of power by the British government. Would you tell us about the English roots and origins of the Fourth Amendment? The historical record is complex, involving 100 years of the evolution and regulation of search and seizures with many contradictory developments. But the amendment itself was influenced and was the direct result of events beginning really about 1760 and accumulating in the amendment, which was finally adopted in 1791. So that 30-year period, particularly the 10 or 15 years just before the American Revolution, were the catalyst for the Fourth Amendment. Those are the events that are most often recalled in Supreme Court opinions and was referred to by the framers as the reasons why the amendment was adopted. I want to start with the events in Massachusetts in 1760 and 1761, because they precede the important English events, if I may, and talk about what happened in Massachusetts Bay Colony. Yeah, that would really be great, because I know John Adams wrote in 1817 that he thought the child independence was born in 1761, which is exactly that period that you're talking about. So I know we'd love to hear more about that. So let me paint a picture for you. It's 1760. The English king dies. And when the English king dies, all writs issued by the court expire. One of the writs that was used were called writs of assistance. And that was used by the customs officials as the vehicle to search for uncustom goods in America. Smuggling was a widespread practice in the American colonies and the writs were used in an attempt to combat it. And so the court in early 1761, after a new king was on the throne, was presented with a request to issue new writs by the custom officials in Boston. Writs of assistance allowed customs officials to go anywhere they wanted at any time they wanted for no reason or any reason at all. They were not issued under oath. There was no justification for them, such as probable cause for it. It was just a piece of paper that allowed them to search at will. So a group of merchants hired a man named James Otis, who was an attorney, to represent them to try to limit the way in which these writs could be issued by the court. It's Massachusetts Bay. It's the old state house in downtown Boston. And on the second floor was the courthouse. In that room was this important case. It was filled with 
important people. And there were two people that were important arguing the case. The first was Jeremiah Gridley, who was the attorney general for Massachusetts Bay Colony. And he defended this open-ended writs to enforce the custom laws. And he argued that we needed these open-ended writs because it generated money to support the armies and the fleets and the custom. And without custom duties, we couldn't support these military activities. You've got to remember in 1760, 1761, Britain was at war. It was called the Seven Years' War in Europe and in the colonies. It was called the French and Indian War. So they're at war. They needed revenue. And this is a source of revenue. The key issue here in this Ritz case was, should the court continue to grant the Ritz in a general open-ended form or limit them to a single occasion based on particularized information given under oath? Well, Otis, representing the merchants, was the first person in the United States or anywhere to make this type of argument. He argued that these writs were against the fundamental principles of law, that they placed the liberty of every man in the hands of every petty officer, that a man's house was his castle, and that these writs, which were a form of a general warrant, would totally annihilate this privilege. And I'll quote here, he said that the custom house officials may enter our houses when they please, they may break locks, bars, and everything in their way. And whether they break through malice or revenge, no man, no court can inquire. Bare suspicion without oath is sufficient. Now, that was the attack, but here's what he did that's as important. He offered a vision of a different way to search and seize. And this alternative model was never argued before in any court. And that alternative model was based on the common law search warrant for stolen goods, which required probable cause to search. They had to be done under oath, and there had to be a particular description of the place to be searched and the things to be seized. That's familiar language to us because that's the warrant clause of the Fourth Amendment. The warrant clause comes from his argument in the Ritz case. He lost. The court continued to issue these writs in this open-ended form, but he gained a place in history, and he was perhaps one of the most important early leaders in the events that led to the revolution. He was famous in the United States in part because of this case. He was called the Patriot. He was a leader in the Massachusetts legislature at the time, and for a decade was a thorn in the side of colonial government. And just to finish on Otis, he was disabled by the time of the revolution by mental illness. And by the early 1770s, he was sidelined because of his mental problems. And this is interesting, at least to me. Otis said at one point, I'm going to die by being struck by lightning. By the time he was mentally disabled, he was living with his sister in her farmhouse on a clear day, no storms involved. He was standing in the doorway of the house and he was struck and killed by lightning. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a great story. Now, one of the themes we've been exploring in this series on the Bill of Rights and the Fourth Amendment is how lawyers and historians use history when it comes to the law and how they use it a bit differently from each other. You mentioned that James Otis Jr. was this lawyer who was hired by these merchants in Boston and Salem to fight the legality of these open-ended writs of assistance, and that he offered this brand new reason for why these open-ended writs of assistance were legal. Do we have any idea of how Otis, the lawyer, may have used his knowledge of history to make his argument? That's why I emphasize that he was the first person, at least in recorded history, to make these type of arguments. He was familiar with the common law search warrant as an alternative, and that was evolving at that time. So as a lawyer, he had some familiarity with an alternative way to search and seize that was more protective of individual rights. And beyond that, we don't know because he burned all his notes. We don't 
know the sources that he used. I think a lot of this was simply creative work on his part, but frankly, we don't know. What we do know is how detailed his arguments were because one of the persons in the audience at the time was a young lawyer named John Adams. And John Adams used this historical event and the lessons from that and found that as one of the most impactful parts of his entire life. And he repeatedly returned to Otis's argument throughout his life. So let me talk about Adams just for a moment here, because I think this is fundamentally important. You can draw a straight line from Otis through Adams to the Fourth Amendment, and I'd like to draw that line if possible. Otis was an attorney, and this was a big event, this writs of assistance case, and Adams was a young attorney at the time. This was 1761. On July 3rd, 1776, Adams wrote a letter to his wife. Now, think of July 3rd, 1776. Adams is just finished with Jefferson drafting the American document called the Declaration of Independence. They're in Philadelphia. They voted on July 2nd for independence. And he is sitting in his room and he writes this letter to his wife the next day. He says, When I look back, to the year 1761 and recollect the argument concerning writs of assistance in the Superior Court, which I had hitherto considered as the commencement of this controversy between Great Britain and the United States. I am surprised at the suddenness as well as the greatness of this revolution. So this was a searing moment in his life, and he repeats it over and over again. That's July 3rd, 1776, 15 years later. But 50 years later, he's saying this. And this quote is repeated in Supreme Court opinions a lot. This is a letter he wrote in 1817. Every man of a crowded audience appeared to me to go away, as I did, ready to take up arms against writs of assistance. Then and there was the first scene of the first act of opposition to the arbitrary claims of Great Britain. Then and there, the child independence was born. So, obviously, it had a lifelong impact on Adams. Well, so what? What's that mean? What the importance of that is, is when Adams, in 1779, the Massachusetts Revolutionary Legislature asked Adams to write a new constitution for Massachusetts. And he did. And his preamble to the constitution was the Declaration of Rights. In that Declaration of Rights is the Massachusetts analog to the Fourth Amendment. And if you look at the Fourth Amendment, the first clause of the Fourth Amendment is Adams's language the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects shall not be violated by unreasonable searches and seizures. That was the model for the Fourth Amendment, which flows from Adams by way of Otis. The second sentence of the Massachusetts Declaration of Rights was the warrant clause, and it was very wordy. and. Madison, when he actually drafted the constitutional amendment later, took Adams' first sentence, made it the first clause of the Fourth Amendment, and then cleaned up, basically, the warrant clause, and that's resulted in the Fourth Amendment. So, from Otis through Adams through Madison is this line of authority that really was very much inspired by Otis and the English events that we can talk about. Yeah. And we should talk about these English events because, as you mentioned, James Otis was out there in 1761 making a novel argument about proper search and seizure. And then following Otis's argument, there were a couple of really important English court decisions about search and seizure. So would you tell us about these cases and whether Otis's argument had any impact on these cases and on English common law when it came to search and seizure? 
Well, there's no historical evidence of any impact that Otis had on English events. There was parallel developments in England that also attacked General Warrens. There's two primary cases involved here, the first of which is a case called Wilkes. John Wilkes was a famous Englishman for a lot of reasons, and he was famous in the United States as a result of these events and other events. Think of John Wilkes Booth, the assassin of Lincoln. He was named after Wilkes. There's a lot of towns in the United States named after Wilkes, too. He became famous, and the reason he became famous is because of these general warrant cases. So, in the early 1760s, there's this series of pamphlets called the North Britain that were published anonymously in London. And Wilkes was the author, at least of some of them. And these pamphlets derided government ministries and criticized governmental policies. And they used strong language. And after a particularly bitter attack in what was called North Britain number 45, and I'll come back to that number in a little while, North Britain number 45, the government decided to apprehend and prosecute the responsible party for seditious libel. They didn't know who it was. So a warrant was issued by the Secretary of State for messengers ordering them to go out and look for the authors, printers, and publishers of this treasonous paper called North Britain No. 45 and to seize all of their papers. This was a general warrant. No one was specified. No place to search was specified. And there was no justification other than just go out and get them. So in the next three days, 49 persons were arrested. And eventually the messengers located the printers and learned Wilkes' identity. He was then arrested and all of his private papers were searched. The printers and Wilkes sued, saying that this type of warrant and arrest violated their rights as Englishmen. The case was heard before a justice called Pratt, who was soon to be elevated and called Lord Camden, and he agreed with Wilkes. Otis lost his case, but Wilkes won, and Pratt condemns these general warrants and details among other things, that he says, if the power to issue such warrants existed, it would affect the person and property of every man in this kingdom and would be totally subversive of liberty. So that's the first of the general warrant cases. Wilkes ultimately was elected to parliament after returning from exile. He left the country for a while. This case became famous in the United States, and Wilkes became famous in the United States, that number 45 became a popular symbol in the United States. And so the Sons of Liberty in Boston, for example, wrote him a letter in 1768 saying, the Friends of Liberty, Wilkes, Pieces, and Good Order to the number 45, and go on and talk about how what a wonderful person he is, right? So they saw him as a hero, and this idea of Wilkes and Liberty and the number 45 became popular symbols. And it was so popular that in that same year, the Sons of Liberty in Boston asked Paul Revere to make a bowl for them, which became known as the Liberty Bowl, made out of silver. And on one side of the bowl is a drawing by Revere of number 45, and it says Wilkes and Liberty. And on one side of this, there's a torn general warrant. And on the other symbol on that side is Magna Carta. So this became another element of why we had the Fourth Amendment, is the winning of this general warrants case. This bull at one point was described as one of the three most cherished of our historical treasures, along with the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. It's kind of going away now. No one knows about it. But it's in the Massachusetts Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. The other English case is called Antic versus Carrington. That was a couple years after Wilkes, 1765. And this is the other case that the Supreme Court continually refers to in the history of general warrants. 
and why we had the Fourth Amendment. It's described as a monument of English history in the Supreme Court opinions and was undoubtedly familiar to every American statesman at the time of the Constitution and was considered the true and ultimate expression of constitutional law. So Entick was also a critic of the government, was also publishing anonymous papers, and they found out about him, and they issued a warrant to arrest him. So this was not a general warrant as to who to arrest, it was to arrest him. But the warrant also said, seize all of his papers, not just the libelous ones, but all of his papers. And so he sued on the basis of the general warrant that they seized all of his papers. And the same judge, now called Judge Camden, Lord Camden, heard that case. He won. And in his opinion, supporting the jury's verdict, Camden condemns the scope of the warrant and says if such a warrant were legal, then all the secret cabinets and bureaus of every subject in this kingdom would be thrown open to search. He compared this warrant unfavorably to the common law search warrant for stolen goods, which required an oath, particular description, and a factual justification for the search, and talked about the importance of property rights in England, and said that the great end for which men entered society was to secure their property, and that this type of warrant violated those rights. So those are the three pillars. Otis in the Ritz of Assistance case, Wilkes, and Antic. And all of those were in mind when the framers drafted the amendment and state constitutions. At the time of the revolution, the revolutionary governments in each one of the states, almost all of them at least, passed search and seizure provisions. And all of them condemned general warrants, but only Adams in the Constitution of Massachusetts had this broader language that became the Fourth Amendment. So those are the events that were in the framers' mind at the time that the amendment was drafted. And those are the events that, if you read Supreme Court opinions, the court continues to return to. Did these English cases and legal precedents that came with Wilkes and Entick did these precedents make their way into the American practice of English common law before independence? And I ask because these decisions came down during the 1760s, which was a period of pretty intense protest during the American Revolution and a time when court decisions and the application of the law were a bit more haphazard than they were before the protests and after the revolution would conclude. Yes, they did. Wilkes and Antics certainly came back to the United States because as I indicated, the Sons of Liberty were, for example, knew about Wilkes, and all of these towns are named after him, and people were named after him, and he was celebrated. And, for example, he used to use the Liberty Bowl and drink 45 toasts to Wilkes, named after that 45th edition of the North Britain. The idea that warrants should be limited in duration and that you needed a particular description and under oath were well established based on those cases, Otis's argument, by the time the Constitution was drafted in 1787. The Fourth Amendment became part of the Constitution in 1791. You mentioned earlier that James Madison, when he set out to write the proposal that became the Fourth Amendment, that Madison really relied on the Massachusetts Constitution and other documents to draft his proposed protection against general warrants. Could you tell us a bit more about how Madison framed the amendment and about the different sources that really inspired his framing of the Fourth Amendment? So in 1787, when the new constitution was being drafted, Madison was saying that we don't need a Bill of Rights. In 89, to become elected to Congress, he promised that he would draft a Bill of Rights for the first Congress, and he did. He took Adams' language for the first clause of the amendment, and then he used other language, I think it was from Pennsylvania, for the second clause of the amendment, and then drafted an amendment 
that addressed only general warrants. And that's what he submitted to committee. The committee thought it was too narrow and made the draft applicable to all unreasonable searches and seizures. And that language is what was ultimately adopted and became the Fourth Amendment in 1791. Do we have any idea what Congress thought of the rest of Madison's wording for the Fourth Amendment? We know Congress went through Madison's amendments one by one and reworked them all. But aside from broadening the language to include all unreasonable searches and seizures, what did Congress think of Madison's wording for the Fourth Amendment? Yeah, the uh, history here gets really sparse. We know that the committee changed the wordings. It's disputed who was the person who actually changed the wording. And now the historical dispute is how important that change is. How broad is the amendment, you know, after it was expanded not only to address general warrants, but more generally all searches and seizures. There's very little, and I've explored this, and many other scholars have looked at this in great detail. There's just not much there in terms of a historical record. When you say you've explored these changes to the Fourth Amendment, could you tell us about some of the historical sources you used where you would hope to find information about these revisions? Well, there's contemporary records, the committee records from Congress. You can look at the individual states when they were debating the amendment and what they thought of it, how broad they thought it would be. You can look at the newspaper accounts and discussions of that era, really from 1787 to 91. Do we need this type of search and seizure provision? How broad does this provision need to be? There is just not that much there. Almost all of the comments, and I've looked at all of this, are very short comments of, well, let's condemn general warrants. No, we need a broader provision. And that's about it. And I think part of the reason for that is because, as one scholar said to me, it was just in the air. Everybody knew about Otis. Everybody knew about Wilkes. Everybody knew about Antic. And it was just a given that they thought it was necessary to have a provision regulating governmental searches and seizures. And there's hardly any recorded discussion of the details. Now, we've talked a lot about the context of the Fourth Amendment and how it came to be an amendment. And I wonder, why do you think it's important that we work to understand the historical context of the Fourth Amendment and where this amendment and all its different language came from? In the Supreme Court, there's a never-ending debate about the importance of history in interpreting the Fourth Amendment. It's not that history is unimportant. The court has said that history is the tool, the most important tool in understanding the Fourth Amendment. It's how you use history is what the debate is. And sometimes the court has limited the scope of the protections of the amendment to exact practices. That is that the common law of 1791 defines the proper rules to regulate government intrusions and that We're not going to expand the scope of protections beyond what the framers and what was occurring in 1791. Exact practices were prohibited, and that's as far as we're going to go. More broadly is the alternative view, and that is that the role of history is to ascertain the framers' intent that under this view, historical abuses that prompted the Fourth Amendment were more important to the framers than the common law requirements, and that under this view, framers intended not only to prohibit specific evils, but based on the general terms used in the amendment, to give the Fourth Amendment enduring value. That is, under this view, the chief interpretive tool is to be consistent with the framers' values, but not mired in the details of search and seizure practice of 1791. You can see that debate goes back and forth in Supreme Court opinions, there really isn't any tiebreaker other than one side has managed to get five justices to agree in any one given case. Could you give us an example of 
how the Supreme Court has used history to interpret the Fourth Amendment? Sure. I'll talk about the broader view because that is what has been most recently used in some Supreme Court opinions. How do you apply something that was adopted in 1791 to modern conditions? Is that even possible? Think of cell phones, unknown to the framers. Does the amendment even say anything about that? So in Riley versus California, it's a 2014 case written by uh, Chief Justice Roberts. The court was asked whether or not when a person is arrested and the person has a cell phone on them, can the police search that cell phone incident to the person's arrest? Prior to Riley, the rule was this. Anytime a person's arrested, validly arrested, anything on that person can be searched incident to arrest in any detail that the police officer decides to look. And so if you have a piece of paper on you, you can read it, you can open any container that you have, etc. Can you do that with cell phones? That was the issue before court and Riley. Riley said, no, that's a new rule for cell phones, that you need to get a warrant to look at that cell phone. Where does he get that from? How do you create that rule? How is that justified? And so part of his justification is to look at historical events. And this is the language that Robert said in Riley. I'll just read part of it. This is towards the end of his opinion to support the court's position that the Fourth Amendment regulated this type of new technology. This is what he says. Opposition to these general searches was, in fact, one of the driving forces behind the revolution itself. And then he talks about Otis. In 1761, the patriot, James Otis, delivered a speech in Boston denouncing the risks of assistance. A young John Adams was there, and he would later write that, quote, every man of the crowded audience appeared to go away, as I did, ready to take up arms against writs of assistance. And then he goes on and talks about Otis's speech as being fundamentally important. And then in the next paragraph, he says, modern cell phones are not just another technological convenience. With all they contain, all they may reveal, they hold from many Americans the privacies of life. And here's how he ties it together. This is a quote. The fact that technology now allows an individual to carry such information in his hand does not make the information any less worthy of the protections for which the framers fought. So what's he doing here? He's using history to ascertain the framers' intent, looking at the abuses that prompted the fourth and arguing that those values that the framers had should be honored through time and that we apply and create legal principles to honor those values. So when the Supreme Court considers the Fourth Amendment, it really views history as the most important tool for interpreting that amendment. Does that make the Fourth Amendment unique in that the most important tool the Supreme Court has to interpret it is history? Or is history really important as an interpretive tool for all the amendments. Well, I'm a Fourth Amendment expert, and I spend less time on the other amendments to be candid about it. But having said that, I think the answer is, generally speaking, the role of history in Fourth Amendment analysis has been much more important than the role of history in any of the other amendments. Now, as you pointed out in your discussion of the Riley case, we really do hear a lot about technology and issues of privacy. We hear about how the fang companies, you know, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google, are collecting all our data. And we hear about how people who work for these companies but live in different countries are listening to the data collected by our smart speakers and hearing cases of domestic abuse and other crimes taking place in our own homes. So would you tell us a bit more about how the Fourth Amendment is being applied to these issues of technology and why the Fourth Amendment might be really important to us in the 21st century? Everything is digital now. And anytime the government wants to find someone, to arrest someone, to track someone, it's all digital. Some of the most important evidence in every case is digital. For an example, 
things that you actually don't think about. There was a case in Arkansas recently where the government subpoenaed the water department's records. Why? Because they wanted to know when this person in this particular house was using water. And the water department had put on this house a smart water reader. And this water meter was digital, and it recorded every moment of time when water was being used and the volume of the water used. And that information was sent back to the water department, and that was all stored digitally. Well, what the record showed was on this particular day at 3 a.m. in the morning, there was a high volume of water being used, which was unusual for this house. This man had killed somebody in his driveway and hosed down the bloody scene at 3 a.m. to get rid of the evidence. This is a murder case. And what is important evidence in that case? Some digital record someplace else. And it's true in almost every case now. And drug dealers are using cell phones as part of their transactions, as part of their life. You know, all that evidence is on there. And it just goes on and on and on. So even in garden variety criminal cases, it's important and it's stored someplace. Tracking in vehicles, it just goes on and on. So what the Fourth Amendment does is regulates under what circumstances the government can obtain this evidence. And in Riley, the court said, you need a warrant. And in a subsequent case called Carpenter that just came out last year, the court expanded the protections of the Fourth Amendment to include historical cell phone location information. Every time you have a cell phone, it is constantly communicating with a tower saying, I am here. That's what it does. I am here. I am here. I am here. And every time you move location, it's communicating with other towers and they're recording your location. And so if you have a cell phone, somebody knows where you are at any given time. That could be really important information. And that's what Carpenter was about. Carpenter was accused of being involved in a conspiracy, ironically, to rob uh, cell phone stores. And they did. They robbed five or six of them. And they didn't know who Carpenter was, but they found one of the robbers. And that robber gave up Carpenter's name and Carpenter's cell phone number. And so the police went to the cell phone company and asked, the cell phone company for the records of whether Carpenter was in the location around the robberies at the time of the robberies. Sure enough, the records indicated that Carpenter was in the area at the time of the robberies. Powerful evidence of guilt. Can they do that? Can the police obtain that information? And under what circumstances can they get it? And Chief Justice Roberts wrote this opinion again. This was only a 5-4 decision at this point, saying that to get this type of information, you need a warrant based on probable cause, oath, and particular description. So, if you put Riley together and Carpenter together, these are the most important Supreme Court decisions on digital evidence. And both of them, the Chief Justice was applying this old document to give protections to individuals in this modern world against what he calls government overreach. Tom, is there one thing about the Fourth Amendment and its history that you really wished more people knew and understood? Well, this has been great because I think what is important is where it came from, who Otis was, and the values that we're attempting to preserve. It's a never-ending debate. What are we trying to do under the Fourth Amendment? Are we trying to just simply regulate the police? You could create a certain number of rules to do that. Or are we trying to protect individuals from overreaching governmental activity? Depending on which point of view you have, you start from a much different premise and you can create much different rules. And all of the historical analysis, in my view, points to well, a certain point of view, and that is that the framers designed the Fourth Amendment to protect individuals from the government. That was a fundamental goal, and it wasn't just simply to 
help facilitate or regulate governmental intrusions. You start with the premise and the point of view that this is to protect individuals, then rules are spun out with that point of view. We need to protect individuals. I think Riley does that, and I think Carpenter does that. And based on those premises, you reach results. If you start from the other point of view, all we're trying to do is regulate the police, then you have a much different set of rules. An alarm was spread far and wide. Merchants of Salem and Boston applied to Mr. Pratt, who refused, and to Mr. Otis and Mr. Thatcher, who accepted, to defend them against the sensible, menacing monster, the writ of assistance. Great fees were offered, but Otis and I believe Thatcher would accept none. In such a cause, said Otis, I despise all fees. Otis was a flame of fire. With a promptitude of classical illusions, a depth of research, a rapid summary of historical events and dates, a profusion of legal authorities, he hurried away all before him. American independence was then and there born. The seeds of patriots and heroes to defend the vigorous youth were then and there sown. Every man of an immense crowded audience appeared to me to go away, as I did, ready to take arms against writs of assistance. Then and there was the first scene of the first act of opposition to the arbitrary claims of Great Britain. Then and there, the child independence was born. The Fourth Amendment in the Bill of Rights is both a promise and a right. It's a promise and a right to be secure against the government but it's also a limited right. As Tom helped us see, the Fourth Amendment provides us the right to be secure in just four objects, our persons, our houses, our papers, and our effects. Anything not on that list is not protected by the Fourth Amendment. Further, the Fourth Amendment stipulates that we have this protection only against unreasonable government searches and seizures. To protect us against unreasonable searches and seizures, the Fourth Amendment's warrant clause specifies that the government must obtain a warrant to conduct a search, and that to obtain that warrant, it must provide an oath or affirmation of probable cause. Plus, the warrant the government obtains from the courts has to specify the places to be searched and the persons and things to be seized. Now, the Fourth Amendment was really the framers' answer to a grievance they had against the British Crown, which, up through the 1760s, granted government officials like customs officers general open-ended warrants. These writs of assistance allow customs officers to search wherever they wanted, whenever they wanted, and to seize whoever and whatever they wanted. As Tom outlined for us, there is a direct line between the Boston and Salem merchants' challenge of these writs of assistance to the Fourth Amendment. That line begins with James Otis Jr.'s arguments against the writs. Its next stop is with John Adams, who offered a protection against the general open-ended warrant in the Massachusetts State Constitution of 1780. And then the line concludes with James Madison, who proposed a civil liberties amendment that would offer a constitutional protection against unreasonable searches and seizures. Plus, there were also the parallel legal cases against general open-ended warrants that took place in England also during the 1760s. The Wilkes case of 1763 and the Entick case of 1765 became well-known legal cases in British North America. And along with Otis's case, these English cases really informed how Americans thought about government searches and seizures and whether and how the government's use of general warrants seemed unreasonable. It is these three cases, Otis, Wilkes, and Entick, that serve as the three pillars of the Fourth Amendment. They're also the cases the United States Supreme Court refers to whenever it interprets the Fourth Amendment. Now, as Tom just told us, and as Mary Builder revealed to us in episode 259, the Supreme Court is involved in a never-ending debate about the importance of history and how they should use history to interpret the Constitution and Bill of Rights. Now, over the years, the justices have said and ruled in ways that show us that history is the most important tool when it comes to understanding the Fourth Amendment. But the justices often debate about how to use history. Now, sometimes the Supreme Court uses history quite narrowly. It looks at the common law of 1791 and uses those rules and laws from 1791 to regulate government intrusions in our modern day. At other times, 
the Supreme Court justices use history to ascertain the framers' intent. They use history to identify why the framers created certain passages of the Constitution and why they created amendments like the Fourth Amendment. They then use that knowledge of history to apply and adapt the Constitution and its amendments to fit within both the framers' intent and the context of our own present time. And this raises a couple of questions for us. How and why has the Supreme Court developed and changed its interpretations of the Fourth Amendment between 1791 and today? And how and why do these changes in the Court's interpretations of the Fourth Amendment impact how we look at and define our rights today? These are important questions and issues, and we'll explore them in our next and final episode in our Doing History series on understanding the Fourth Amendment. History and law are all around us, and because of the intertwined nature of history and American law, the history of law can tell us a lot about our rights and our civil liberties. The court adjourned for consideration, and after some days at the close of the term, Hutchinson, Chief Justice, arose and said, The court has considered the subject of writs of assistance, and can see no foundation for such a writ. But as the practice in England is not known, it has been thought best to continue the question to next term, that in the meantime opportunity may be given to write to England for information concerning the subject. In six months, the next term arrived, but no judgment was pronounced. Nothing was said about writs of assistance, no letters from England, and nothing more ever said in court concerning them. But it was generally reported and understood that the court clandestinely granted them, and the custom house officers had them in their pockets, though I never knew that they dared to produce and execute them in any one instance. John Adams. Look for more information about Tom, his book, The Fourth Amendment, plus notes and links for everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 261. Would you like to know more about early American ideas when it comes to search and seizure? Joseph Edelman has commissioned a blog post to accompany this episode, and this post is by Lauren Duvall, an assistant professor of history at the University of Oklahoma. Lauren has written a post called Domestic Tranquility, Privacy in the Household in Revolutionary America. I've included a link to this post in the show notes, and you'll find it in your Ben Franklin's World app. Also in the show notes and in your Ben Franklin's World app, is a link to Holly White's updated handy reference list of legal terms. Holly has been updating this list as we go along, and it contains all the legal terms and ideas that we've been discussing over the last three episodes. So be sure you check out this reference list. Again, I've placed a link in the show notes and in your Ben Franklin's World app. Production assistance for this podcast comes from the Omohundro Institute's digital projects team. Joseph Edelman, Martha Howard, Kayla Pittman, Holly White, and Karen Wolf. Breakmaster Cylinder, composed our custom theme music. Finally, what do you think of John Adams' assertion that the first real act of opposition to Great Britain came with James Otis's argument against writs of assistance? Do you think that's when the child independence was really born? I'm curious what you think, because we scholars of the revolution debate these issues of the revolution all the time. So let me know where you stand on it. Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute.